Well, this is Mickey and Marielos McKinney. They're missionaries of our church. Uh, I've had the privilege of knowing them for over 25 years and have watched them grow and do the things that they do. And I can really highly recommend them to you. Now, the name Marielos is Maria of the Angels, just the way they put it together. And Maria of the Angels is our patron saint in Costa Rica. So I said in Sunday school that 20% of the young women in Costa Rica had that name. She said 70% have that name. But you shorten it to Marielos. And so I'm going to let Mari say a few words, and then Mickey's going to bring the word to us. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And I believe since seven years ago, they're not busy you, but we are glad to be here. And, and thank you for all your prayers and your, for your support. And for all the, the letters that you sent us and the cards, they really encourage us. May the Lord bless you today. Thank you. Thank you. And, and they have done the Costa Rican thing. They brought a gift. It's a classic coffee. Now, they say it's for the church, but I don't know that you guys would really understand <laughs> Costa Rican coffee. <laughs> oh, you think so? Okay, I'm going to give it to Sharon. Yes, you, you take it. It's for the church. Remember. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. It, it, that is Sunday morning coffee. It will keep you awake. Plenty of caffeine. Of course, Pastor Mike will probably keep you awake as well. And thank you, Pastor Mike. Lord bless you. And the Lord bless you all. I grew up in a small town in Alabama, in the right in the middle of Alabama, called Brent. So if I speak funny, it's because I'm from Alabama. And if I, or it's because I'm from Costa Rica and I'm used to preaching and teaching in Spanish. So if I speak funny, please forgive me. But if the Lord speaks to you this morning, praise Him. Praise God. Marielos and I have the privilege of making disciples in Costa Rica. Over 25 years ago, nearly 30 years ago, the Lord placed on my heart to go and make disciples in all the world. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teaching them all they have taught you and know I'm with you always. Because he has all the authority. And I praise God for that calling. It has been a bumpy road. It has been quite difficult. But we praise God because there's been much fruit in this ministry. And not because of anything that we've done. But because of everything that God has done. And I'd like to speak to you today then, since the ministry that God has given us and the anointing of the Holy Spirit that we have is to make disciples, then I ask of you today then, what is the mark of a new Christian or a true Christian? What is the brand that is burned onto the new Christian? What is the brand that is burned onto a true Christian? And before getting into that, may I say a word of prayer. Father God, your grace is so enormous that you can take what many call the scum of the earth and transform it into a new creature, a son of God. That you can take the impoverished and give them hope, and not just hope in this world, but eternal hope and eternal life. Father, we thank you that you can take those who seem to have no faith at all and, and make them mighty men and women who carry your word throughout the world. Father, we thank you for your love that just inundates us and floods us. And Lord, allow that love that comes from you to make us be as we should and live as we should in the light of Jesus Christ. Father, speak to us today. Holy Spirit that lives in us, that's transforming us, renewing us. Holy Spirit, open our minds to your word. 
Open our hearts to your grace. Transform us and speak to us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So when I ask you, what is the mark of a new Christian? Or what is the brand of a true Christian? And I'm not talking about the seal of God over his children. We know what the seal of God is. 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22 says, Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God who has sealed us and gave us the Spirit in our hearts as a pledge. Or in Ephesians 1.13, In Him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you, how you were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise. So we have the Holy Spirit, we have the seal of God. But what I'm asking you, what is it that distinguishes us as Christians from non-believers? So I'd like to read a little portions out of Romans 5, 1 through 5. And then we'll continue with the word that the Lord has given us. But from here, Romans 5, 1 through 5. I'm reading from the New American Standard Version because folks down in Alabama like to keep it traditional. So I don't know what version you're reading from. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have attained our introduction by faith into His grace in which we stand, and we exult in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. And perseverance, proven character. And proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has given us. So again, what I would like to speak about today is this, that which distinguishes us as sons of God, daughters of God, from the non christian Part of what Marielos and I do in Costa Rica, we have a prison ministry. We go into the same prison, the same cell block, into the same place, same cafeteria area where we're allowed to go in and, and disciple these men who have, because of the mistakes and sins and the, and the meanness in their lives, have carried them to be where they are. So part of what we do is this prison ministry, which we've been doing for about 15 years. And there was a time when we would notice that every time that the men would be called out to, out of their cells so that we could give them the discipleship and counseling that the Lord has given us to give them, there was a time when the, there was this group of about seven Chinese men would come out and have their supper or dinner. A supper, as we say in Alabama, dinner. So I was kind of curious, so we asked, why do these Chinese men always come out and have their dinner at the time when we're given the discipleship? And we asked, even asked the prison guard about this, and he said, well, they're the Chinese mafia, part of the Chinese mafia. And they ordered their own special food and have it brought into them, and they don't want to mix with the other Costa Rican, Nicaraguans, and whoever else is in the prison, and they have their dinner by themselves. But it's the same time that we have to have them out when, when, you're, when you're here. But during that time, there's always this one Chinese little guy. He'll come up and he'll listen, he'll listen. He'll never say a word. And before he knew it, they were, they were gone. They had been shipped out to the maximum security. And then about six or seven months later, that one Chinese guy asked to be come back to this, to this cell block. Because he says... There was something different about those men in that cell block. There was something different, and I could see that they were kind of shining. Well, not everyone in the cell block, but at least the 60 to 70 men that were in the discipleship group. And uh, he said, I wanted that. I wanted to be different. He said, what is it? And I said, 
Well, the Bible says you must be born again. What is that? Well, you must be born of water and of truth and of the Spirit. Receive Jesus Christ and believe in Him and you will be saved and you will be transformed and God will bless you and change you. And that was the beginning of that one Chinese mafia's road to heaven. So, speaking of prison ministry, if it were a crime to be a Christian in the United States, it seems like it's going that way. I don't know much about politics, but if it were a crime to be a Christian here in the United States, would there be enough evidence against the majority of those who say they are Christian to, to condemn them, to convict them of being a Christian? And pardon me for being a little more personal. If there were a crime to be a Christian in the United States, would there be enough evidence against you, personally, to convict you of 10 years in prison, maybe? In the business world, everything has a brand. If I were to ask you, what is the brand name of a soft drink, what would you say? Coke, Coca-Cola. It's been the Coca-Cola throughout the world. Or faster to name a brand of a tennis shoe. Nike, yes. Or what about a brand of a, of a cell phone? IPhone. Samsung, iPhone, yes. Everything has a brand. The same is true about the countries. If I ask you to name something about Brazil, what would you say? Soccer, yes. Well, what distinguishes China? Other than communism. <laughs> made in China. Everything's made in China. Or, or the Great Wall or something like that. If I ask you what distinguishes the United States, what would you say? Freedom, the American dream. Yes. So with all this in mind, thinking about would I be convicted if I were, uh, uh, if I were, were accused, thank you, of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence against me? And what is the brand then that is burned on the true Christian? We have the seal, we have the Holy Spirit, but what is the brand? A true Christian is justified, as we have seen. I have just read, a true Christian is justified and should shine as a light. As a city set on a hill, it cannot be, cannot be hidden. With the mark of a true Christian, indeed, we should shine and rejoice in our suffering and trials. The mark of a true Christian has three characteristics. Three characteristics. Faith which endures forever, hope, which also endures forever, and the greatest of those that endures forever, love. So I dare say to you this morning, if you like any of these three, even if you think it's just a little bit of faith that I need more faith, or any little bit of hope, or even just a little bit more love, if you like anything in any of these three, then maybe we are not shining as the light of the world. Maybe we're not carrying the mark or the brand of a true Christian. Maybe we're not living as one justified as we ought. And as in Costa Rica, they will say, this is hypocrisy. That's why I don't want to go to the evangelical church. Because I don't see anything different in you than, than the way everybody else is living. So let's talk about these three a little bit. Faith. Faith. The difficulties we face in life, because as we should rejoice in our justification, you know. The difficulties we face in life makes a person react in one or two ways. It either makes a person cling to his faith, proclaim his faith, and live according to his faith and grow closer to the Lord and grow more uh, rejoiceful in his relationship with God. Or it may make a person who only professes to be a Christian to lose his faith. Persecution and trials often do that. But remember, by faith, we 
see the invisible. We believe the unbelievable. And we profess the impossible. By faith we see the invisible. We believe the unbelievable. And we profess the impossible. Because everything is possible by God. There's this illustration. There's two sisters. One was about seven. The other was about six years old. And one day they decided to get together and say, hey, let's count our nickels. We might have enough nickels to, to, to buy something together. So the first girl, the older girl, the seven-year-old, counted her nickels. And she counted one, two, three, four, five. She had five nickels. And she told her little sister, I have 25 cents. The six-year-old counted her nickels. She took them out. She counted. And she also had five. One, two, three, four, five nickels. She looked at her older sister and said, I have 30 cents. The older sister, no, you have five nickels. I have five nickels. We both have 25 cents. And the little sister said, yes, but daddy at breakfast today said that he was going to give us a nickel tonight. So I have 30 cents. And you have 30 cents. Because the little sister acted more on her faith knowing that she could believe her father to give her another nickel at the end of, end of the day. All too often, Christians live more like the older sister. We see what's in front of us. We see what we have. We count that, and that's what we have. When we should be living more like the younger sister. God has promised us things, and we can believe that, and we can count on that. And we will have that. If God promised you something, even if you haven't seen it yet, you can count it as yours. Hebrews chapter 11 is, is full of people who are full of faith who did not see all of the promises that God had given them, but they lived according to that faith and those promises. This reminds me of a young lady called Andrea in Costa Rica. A little bit about what we do. Mariel and I have several other ministries. One of them is we have a home Bible study where we have about 10 people in our home. Every, every, it used to be every Thursday, now every Tuesday. And another ministry we have is a children's feeding program in a really impoverished, very impoverished area in San Jose called Rio Azul. One evening while we were ending Bible study, and it was raining cats and dogs. I mean, it was just a typical October rain for Costa Rica. And it was, you know, time to call out Noah and all this kind of stuff. And it was just really raining. And, we, and the people at the home Bible study just did not want to go home. And I didn't want them to go home because I had to take half of them home. And I didn't want to get out in the rain. But Andrea called Marielos just desperate. Marielos, the rain is going to wash my house down the mountain. I don't think the foundation can stand anymore. The water's coming up over the wall and in the floor. And she lives on a steep hill where the water washes down and could come into her house. And the foundation was a tree stump with a wooden post on top of it as one of the corner pillars of the house on the far end of it. And all the rest of the posts are this small three-by-three three post that at any time would just wash away. So we believed her because we've seen her house, been to her house. I said, Andrea, we'll pray for you right now. The Lord protect you and your children. At the time, she had three small children. That Saturday, while we was at a meeting for those who go into the prison, there's a, a group of us that go in, about 30 of us. It was at a meeting Saturday, and, and, and it just happened to be we had some guests for a Kairos program. Kairos is a program where... Uh, or men can go in and live with the prisoners during the day and, and give them uh, a Bible study and discipleship. And we had guests from Tennessee with us. So I went to speak with this gentleman, a Joshua. And it turns out that Joshua builds foundations for houses after, a, well, in the south we get tornadoes after tornadoes and, and floods come through. And so we go in and we help rebuild foundations. I just said, can you come look at this house for me? So I took him up to Rio Azul and he looked at it. I said, what do you recommend? He said, tear down the house and rebuild it. 
I said, we can't do that. What do you recommend? So we recommended some footings and this and that and other things. So he left, and, and we got some footings and this, that, and the other thing and, and steadied the foundation and put in, you know, plywood on the floor. But the rains kept coming. Earthquakes still happened all the time. And the house was still very much in danger. And Andrea said, but I know God will give me another house. And there's these ministries that come through called Techo por mi país, which is like a roof for my country. And it's a ministry dedicated to building houses for the poor, and they will never give her the time of day. And then about a year later, Joshua calls and said, I'm coming back to Costa Rica, and I want to look at that house again. So he came down, we took him up, he looked at the house. He said, how much do you calculate it would be to tear down this house and build it back again? We said, about $7,000. He looked at me and said, well, that's how much offering I brought. The exact same amount. Then he said, but give me pictures of the progress. Not that I don't trust you, but I want pictures of the progress because this money was donated by non-believers. And I want to testify to what God is doing in Costa Rica through the pictures that you're doing. So he was trying to shine as the light of the world as well. Do other people know you because of your faith? Can any say of you what the Apostle Paul says about believers in Rome? He says, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the world. Live in such a way that others can see your faith and know your faith and know God because of your faith. Another time when I was leaving the, the prison, one of the guards took us aside and said, I want to thank you all for coming in every week, every time you come in. Okay, you're welcome. But, uh, because this, this cell block is the hardest cell block in this prison. And now it's the most peaceful cell block in this prison. Thank you for coming. Because the men in the prison are living their faith. And there are many examples in the gospel where, where we hear Jesus say, your faith has healed you or your faith has saved you or I haven't seen such faith in all of Israel and because Jesus never failed to recognize the faith of the people. And He never fails to recognize your faith or my faith or anyone's faith. So if you have the brand of a new Christian or a true Christian, then you then we will not let the negative circumstances in your life let you lose your faith. Rather, your faith will increase and you will live with that faith. By faith, we see the invisible, we believe the impossible, and we proclaim, or we believe the unbelievable, and we proclaim the impossible. So then, what is hope? The second part, faith, hope, and love. So we, we are seeing the invisible. We are believing the unbelievable. We're proclaiming the impossible. But hope is similar to faith. But according to Hebrews 11, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. So hope is having the expectation that God will do what He says He will do. And this will bring us joy and assurance and strength. Joy and strength for the hope that we know that God will do what He says He will do. My dad is a simple country person. He made the children garden 10 acres every summer. And that was our garden for the children. But my dad would always say, do not expect anything from anyone and you will not be disappointed. It's kind of like a country type wisdom there. Because people often do let us down when we expect something from them, we don't get it and we're disappointed. But on the other hand, we can expect, we must expect, we have to expect that God will do all that He promises. And God will do all that He promises. And this will give us joy and strength as we walk by faith with Him. Going forward in any circumstances of life. Amen.
And with the verse that we all know, yet those who wait on the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. And they will walk and not become weary. Let me tell you about Fernando. Fernando is our current in cell block group leader for our discipleship group. Fernando had spent 15 years in prisons for running drugs, for dealing drugs. He was, a, he was part of a cartel. And he spent 15 years in prison. And while he was in prison, he became a Christian. He got out of prison. He, he founded a paint company and he, where he could paint houses for a living. And, and he was, you know, spreading, living a decent life. And he was, he was living his faith. He was serving in his church. And one day he was painting the house of a friend. And while he was inside the house painting, the special police forces raided the house, found drugs in the attic, arrested the owner, arrested Fernando, and Fernando's back in prison for drugs again. I said, what hope does Fernando have then? But his hope is in Christ Jesus. And he is praising the Lord. And he was sharing that with Marty Ellis, and Marty Ellis said, well, do you, and he was all depressed, and he was all down and out. Of course, who wouldn't be? And Marty Ellis just said, do you love Jesus? He said, yes, of course. Then feed his sheep. And shortly after that, Fernando became our incel block group leader. He had great talents playing the guitar and leading worship and, and also teaching and preaching and the whole deal. God has given him many gifts and talents. He's anointed him in a special way. Fernando had his trial. He came back all depressed again, down and out. He said, I got another 15 years. This time it's my turn. He speaks to me this time. Is it, well, do you love Jesus? Yes, Mickey. Feed his sheep. And he's still there. But the amazing thing is, in Costa Rica, they don't have a trial by a, peer, a jury of your peers. They have a trial of a panel of three to five judges. And this made the news, on TV news even. And while I was watching the news, we saw that they, the report was judges who are distracted because they're all using their cell phones. During the whole trial that, of Fernando, they was using their cell phones, playing or do whatever they were doing on their smartphones or whatever you call them nowadays. So his lawyer appealed, so he's only given three months more in prison to stay there until he's retried again. So when we get back to Costa Rica, he may or may not be there. But God works in mysterious ways, and he gives us hope. When the world says, there's no hope. The true believers always fill with hope. We have joy and strength. Even when the world says just the opposite. So we keep our sights on Christ. We keep our eyes on the things above. We, think our, we keep our eyes on God and focused on what He wants for us. Now I'm not saying a true believer won't have difficult times. There will, there will always be times when, when we will be sad, when we're going through a hardship or suffering for something. Something unexpected is going to happen. Some illness may take over. We may come down with something. Cancer. Or something sad and tragic like happened this week to your beloved pastors here in Omaha. May suffer a bad accident. Some friend may betray us. Loved one may pass away. We live in a fallen world where these things can and do happen and often do. But we cannot take our sights off of Christ. We cannot place our eyes on these things. We must keep our eyes on Christ for His glory, for His resurrection, because He is our eternal hope of salvation. We well, have a dear friend. She's, she doesn't tell us her age, but she's over 80. She says she's 60 every time her birthday comes around. And she, she's, she's a wonderful Christian lady. She's part of our, our team that goes into the prison even. But she's one that's given to being depressed because she takes her eyes off of Christ a lot of times and places it on her circumstances. She has a daughter. And her daughter, actually it's her granddaughter, but she raised her like her daughter. Because her son adopted the girl. But her daughter has gone to India. And every time she goes to India as a missionary, 
Kook, I just get so depressed. My kids have abandoned me. No one's here to love me. She takes her eyes off of Christ. And now that her daughter is, is planning a long-term mission uh, in India, oh, she's just pobrecito yo. Poor little me. So let us pray for Kuka. Let us help her keep her eyes on Christ and rejoice in the fact that she has a daughter who's given her life to the Lord and is serving the Lord in India. There's always hope in Christ. So the second facet or the second characteristic of a true believer is hope. The expectation that God will do all that He says He will do. And that will give us joy and strength in our every circumstance of life. And then there's love. God's love is the greatest and most powerful gift He's ever given us. So love must fill our hearts and must fill our lives, must fill fill all of true believers. Love must inundate us in such a way that it's like a, like a tidal wave. Like a tidal wave that when it hits the shore, it just washes away everything in its path. It just covers it all. And God's love is like that in our lives. And our lives should reflect that and be like that. So we praise the Lord for that. There was this Christian gentleman. He worked in his, what do you call it, cubby hole, you know, computer, and uh, what do you call them, just a little place. And every day for five years, he'd go in and work in his little cubby hole, and he'd have, you know, conversations with a guy next to him. And while he's completing his task, he would often speak with his, with his fellow worker. He would often have lunch with his fellow worker. But all during out these five years, neither of the two knew that the other was a Christian. Neither one of the two were living a life full of love of God in them. That can't be for a new Christian. That cannot be for a true Christian. Because God's love must, must inundate us and be a flood over us and be a flood throughout everything around us. The light of the world was not shining in any one of these two men. The love of God must live in us. It must shine. The one who loves his brother abides in the light. And there's no cause for stumbling in him. And Jesus said it even more clearly. By this all men will know that you are my disciples. If you love, if you have love for one another. Let me talk to you a little bit about Mario. Mario comes to our home Bible study. And Mario is, has a kidney transplant. And Mario is just a bitter man who had to take a bunch of pills all the time. And so we, just speaking with him and, 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 and ministering to him with inner healing ministries that, that God has given us. It turns out that Mario has been a believer for quite a while, even before he got sick, even before he knew he needed a kidney transplant. And it turns out that he has a brother, a brother that was a perfect match for him to have a kidney. And his brother told Mario, I will give you one of my kidneys if you stop this evangelical stuff. If you renounce your Christianity. And Mario, he stood by his faith and said, no, I won't do that. So his brother, all angry with him, his parents practically didn't have anything to do with him anymore. There's this automobile accident of a young lady about 25 years old that he was able to get a kidney from that circumstance. But he has to take a handful of pills every day so that his body will not reject the kidney. These pills affect his, his character, his demeanor all the time, all the time. Just 
ill-mannered. But the power of God came over him. He began loving his family, began forgiving his family, and, and now is reconciled with his, with his parents anyway. And God is still working on his brother. And God is, he's still having to take his pills, but God has transformed his character into a sweet creature of Christ and is now having his own home Bible studies and obeying the Lord. And there's also this one prisoner. He didn't know who had accused him for, for the crime that he committed and was in prison. And then one day, as going to the courts, they handcuffed him to another guy and he went off. They were together in what we call the paddy wagon in the back of his truck with a camper on it. They got out of the, the truck and they went to the court and the guard that was with them was just so surprised. He said, I'm surprised you two are intact. And he looked at him and said, why is that? Because the guy you're handcuffed to is the guy that turned you in. Oh, our buddy said, I felt at the time I wanted to deck him, but you know what? I just turned to him and said, God loves you. Just tell the truth and I'll face the consequences. And may you find the same joy that I have. And he did. He prayed right there in the court to receive Jesus with his prisoner. And they both came back to prison and they were in the discipleship group. Now that is God's love. Now, are we lacking any? Could we do the same thing? The problem is love that it requires us to be humble, sincere, and selfless. It requires us to be humble, sincere, and selfless. We must deny ourselves of what we want. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What a love. How much do we deny ourselves what we want? The opposite of love is not necessarily hate. It can be indifference. Because indifference is a pride that does not allow us to humble ourselves. Pride is something that does not allow us to be sincere. And pride does not allow us to be selfless. Rather, it makes us full of ourselves. And we have this other disciple and his family, Eugenio. Eugenio is a, a tender man often expressing his emotions, which in Latin culture is kind of difficult to do sometimes for a man in a macho thing. And he's always telling us, I love my family, I love my daughter, I love my wife. But his actions often speak very differently. He's not abusive, but he ignores them. He doesn't discipline his daughter that much. He's not with them all the time when they need him. And they are Christian. They are a Christian family. But we found out that Eugenio's problem with being selfless in service toward his family was that in some way or another, he had lost his first child, which was a boy, and sort of seemed to blame his second child, which was his daughter, for the loss of his first child. And when God came into him and, and made him realize that, hey, I just wanted to take your first child home with me. That was just my will. But I want this experience to transform your life so that you love me more than even your children. But at the same time, I want you to love your family more than yourself. And Elhenio is working on changing all that. And God is working on him. And he is changing him in that way. 
so that Eugenio can really live and express his love with more than just word, but with all of his actions toward his family. So love motivates the true believer to action. We love, therefore we do. Not just say. So let us let the love of God inundate our lives. Because we love God. We love our neighbors. We love ourselves. But is that love so evident in us that it's like a tidal wave that just sweeps away everything in its path when it hits the shore? Is that the type of love that you have? What is the mark of a true Christian? What is the brand that is burned on the true Christian? But now, faith, Hope and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Is there anyone here who needs one of those three? Is there anyone here lacking any one of those three, even in just a small portion? I would love to pray for you if there is. I'd love to lay hands on you for God's anointing if there is. If you would just stand up, that would be fine. Anyone needing prayer in these three areas? Praise the Lord. Thank you. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Would it be too much to ask you to come down front? Praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord. Holy Spirit, come. Thank you, Spirit. Fill our lives. Thank you, Father. Lord Jesus, just praise you. Thank you, Father, for your goodness and your kindness, for your mercy, for your grace. Praise you, Father. And Father, ask your anointing upon all of these folks. Come forward, Lord, asking for love, asking you to fill them with faith, asking you to fill them with hope. Father, just touch their lives. Fill them with all that they need, Father. Give them, Lord, a double portion of of yourself. Lord, your anointing be upon them. And Father, we praise you for all that you do. And Father, we just ask now that you fill the lives of these fine people, Lord, with faith, with hope, and with love. Flood their lives, Lord, with your presence. And may your spirit, Lord, that abides in them, Just come upon them in a mighty way. And Father, we praise you for all that you do. And Father, we thank you for the boldness of these people to come forward because they're seeking you and all that you want for them. So Father, bless them. So Father, fill them. So Father, give them all that they're searching for, which can only come through the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, and all that he has done. And we praise you, Father, and we thank you In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you. The Lord bless you, and the Lord give you his peace. Amen. And then I would like to show a video, a PowerPoint, of some of the ministries that God has given to Marielos and I. So... My experts in the tech department can do that. Parents, if you can go get your kids, that would be great.
Mighty Ellis and I thank you for allowing us to be here with you this morning and for sharing. We praise God for you. We thank you for your continuing support for the ministries that he has given us and, and to Mighty Ellis and I. Thank you for your prayers that sustain us very well. And we just ask that you need to pray for us. And if the Lord lays it on your heart also for a little extra donation, we will not be unhappy about that either. So, but may I pray for you. Let's pray. Father, you are good. Thank you, O oh Lord, for your grace, your mercy, and for the great things that you do. Lord, we give you all praise and honor. Because one day the sky will unfold and the trumpet sound will blast and you will call us home and we look forward to an eternity with you. And Father, I pray blessing over this congregation that you just prosper them in all that they do, that they may praise you and glorify you. And Father, again, I just ask that each and every one of their lives be filled with faith, be filled with hope, and be inundated by your love. And Lord, may they be the light of the world. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.